Hello. Um, thank you all so much for joining, for being here on this beautiful, beautiful Earth Day. Um, I'm Carolyn, the program's associate here at the Rail, and I have the extreme pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Nikki Giovanni, um, hosted by Paul Miller. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a working document of some resources and actions. Over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing together in a single monthly publication, art, music, dance, film, theater, and literature, along with thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small nonprofit, we need your support. Your contribution will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and operations here at the Rail. Please check the chat for more information. And now to introduce today's uh, guest and host. One of America's foremost poets, Nikki Giovanni, has received many awards, including seven NAACP Image Awards and the Langston Hughes Award for Distinguished Contributions to Arts and Letters. Giovanni has published numerous, numerous collections of poetry from her first self-published volume, Black Feeling, Black Talk, 1968, to New York Times bestseller, Bicycles, Love Poems, to the Emmy-nominated the Nikki Giovanni Poetry Collection. Her most recent publications include Make Me Rain, Poems and, po and Prose. Composer, multimedia artist, and writer Paul D. Miller, AKA DJ Spooky, has collaborated with an array of recording artists, including Metallica, Chuck D, Steve Rich, and Yoko Ono. His 2018 album, DJ Spooky, presents Phantom Dance Hall, debuted at uh, number three on Billboard Reggae. He's an editor at large for the Brooklyn Rail. And with that, I will pass it over to you, Paul. Thanks so much. Hey, first and foremost, I just want to say I have it's such an honor to meet Nikki. And um, her poetry to me has kind of helped define a path for um, progressive culture, not just African American, but global progressive culture, uh, from rethinking this sort of legacy of how people thought about language and the way it would frame progress and that's a big statement I and mean, Nikki is that powerful um and I just want to say Nikki um I have so many questions I'm not even sure where to begin because I'm like wow wow um in terms of I, I think of you and the last poets in Amiri Baraka as the kind of triumvirate that helped chart the course of uh late 20th century poetry in an African-American and global context um and I also I've always wanted to ask you from a historical perspective how did your context of like the, the Black Progressive Arts Movement shape your first rounds of poetry because um, I, there's there's a couple different layers. And I know you've also been very supportive of many other artists. You've edited anthologies. Um, many artists become very selfish sometimes as they get older and you know, you have a very generous spirit. You know? So I wanna just make sure that the audience is aware of that, that um, from my perspective, growing up in Washington, DC, um, hearing her poetry, um, you know, just really helped uh, as a young artist really, uh, I don't know, make you think another world was possible. So um, Nikki, do you want to talk about like a little bit where you get started and how, you know, it's always good to maybe give the audience a little biographical context. Well, it, it, as the artists that I knew, uh, and I say new because uh, we've lost so many, Margaret Walker, Gwendolyn Brooks were all very generous art, you know, artists. I uh, grew up in Cincinnati. I was born in Knoxville, Tennessee. I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, and of course, right up the street, about 50 miles, Paul Lawrence Dunbar lived. And if Dunbar didn't show us anything, aside from the fact that Maya Angelou, which people forget, I know why the cage bird sings, is, is Paul's poem. It's Paul Lawrence Dunbar's poem. And Dunbar showed us also that you could be, though I didn't need to be shown, if I may say it that way, but that you could be a poet and earn a living. And Dunbar not only purchased a home for his wife and himself, but he purchased a home right next door for his mother. So if you if you're you're saying I want to be a poet, and somebody will say because somebody there's always somebody to say, well, how are you going to earn a living doing that? Well, you can look at Dunbar because he he earned uh, and he showed people this is how you can do it. And he stood up. Um, we wear the mask. I mean, just great 
great poems. I, of course, obviously did not know Mr. Dunbar. And I'm very sad that I didn't know uh, Langston Hughes. Um, I miss Mr. Hughes probably by less than five years. And I'm really, he had passed before I got to uh, New York. I really would love to have had a, um, a meal, <laughs> you know, just sit down and, and have a, a, a meal and a drink with Langston. But I was fortunate enough to meet uh, Jimmy Baldwin and Mr. Baldwin was one of the most generous human beings uh, on earth. So when you say uh, that artists are selfish, maybe some are, but I would say they're stupid mostly, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> they are. But uh, Baldwin was one of the, the most generous, kindest people. He, he extended himself to everybody. And there's an artist that many older people, and I say older Paul, I mean like you, don't know. And his name was, um, uh, and his name still is actually, Ashley Bryant. And Ashley is a children's illustrator. And it was Ashley that broke open the children's uh, uh, community, uh, the, the, uh, the infant, not infant, but the young adults. And one of the things that he did was, uh, there's a, a book that he did is called Beautiful Blackbird. And that broke into the uh, Caldecott and the uh, Newberry. It opened up a lot of doors because we hadn't had a black artist uh, at that point to be recognized for, for what they are. And I really don't know anyone on earth. It's the two people I know on earth that I was fortunate enough to know who are the nice, nobody, I don't know anybody that ever had anything negative or mean to say about Ashley Bryan. And I don't know anybody that had anything negative to say about Dizzy Gillespie. Those are the two men you just, I don't, you could go from one end of the earth to the other and you're not gonna find anybody to say anything negative there two of the most generous human beings. I think that uh, youngsters, I was a youngster to them. I'm not a youngster to you. Uh, like me, we're reminded, you know, though uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm a, a generous, I don't think I'm a not generous person, but we were reminded as we looked at our previous generation, how kind these people were. And uh, I was very close to, to Ashley. Ashley just died a couple of months ago. And uh, I find myself saying only, all the time because I'm getting old myself, but he was only 98. And it was <laughs> such a, I say that only, but uh, we really miss him. And of course we miss, we miss Diz, but we also have to remember no one is dead until they're forgotten. And one of the, looking at some of, some of the uh, predecessors, they are not, uh, they're, they're not, they're not forgotten. And I really love, and, and uh, I've only met him once, uh, Stevie Wonder. And I think Wonder is a very generous genius. And I think when we start to look at uh, the music that he created, he's one of the greatest composers. We we talk about, you know, and it's fine with me, but we talk about George Gershwin. Uh, we talk about Johnny Mercer and, you know, people like that, nothing wrong with them. But uh, one of the great composers of, of, of my gener of our generation, actually, Stevie Wonder. And of course, it's wonderful to hear Stevie Wonder playing with the Count Basie band. And of course, Mr. Basie is gone, but the band continues with his name. And to hear them play Stevie's song, you know, Isn't She Wonderful? And uh, Isn't She Lovely? And Stevie's playing uh, uh, sax, uh, what do you call it? Mike, uh, what is that thing? Harmonica. And it's so wonderful, but we also have Wonder had it had asked it, uh, Dizzy Gillespie to play with him on one of his songs. So I, I, don't, I don't think that I, I don't know the reference you're making because the artists that I know and the artists that I love and have loved is they're, they're very generous people. I, I would okay. tell everybody. No, no, I, I didn't want to imply that your scene wasn't in, in, in electronic music, hip hop, uh, there's songs where everybody's battling and saying, you know, they're, you know, so there, I, the context I grew up in, you have stuff like DJ battles, uh, you have rap battles, you have people. You know, there's a lot. There's a lot of um, how should I put it, a dialectic. You know, that goes on, and the fun part about that is that the, the dialectic sometimes, at least in the music and the scene from the perspective of DJ battles, MC battles, is you usually have to be kind of a clever person with ling language to kind of one up the person. You know, like you, if somebody comes at you with a beat or somebody comes at you with a rhyme, you have to respond. So that's when I say general. Maybe I should have been more careful with my language there. So. Um, I always tend to find that, generationally speaking, one of the really beautiful poems that you did uh, was called Ego Trippin'. And, it, and it's, it's a hip hop term as well these days. You know, they, in fact, there was a hip hop magazine called Ego Trip. And 
one of my favorite lines in that is, uh, you know, like, I, uh, I'm so hip, even my, uh, even when I'm wrong, it's correct. Is that the right rumor? <laughs> yeah, even my errors are correct. Yeah. Even my errors are correct. Yeah. And can you walk us through that poem? And I'm going to uh, ask the audience, if you haven't heard this poem, it's on YouTube, it's everywhere. It is a foundation for our early 21st century uh, future, you know, future vision of things. Um, I just think this is such a powerful poem. How did that poem come to be? Oh, I'm, 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 a, I'm a futurist and I love the galaxy. I just love the idea of going into space. And it's one of those things, you know, uh, Paul Lawrence, uh, not Paul, excuse me, James Weldon Johnson did that and God stepped out on space and he looked around and said, I'm lonely, I'll make me a world. And I thought about that, as it's a, it, I love that poem. And I thought, well, if, if I was gonna make a world, what would I do? And of course, the, the, the main thing I would want is a black woman. So I, I, I went, historically, it's a lot of history in that poem, just kind of stuck in there, you know, and, and uh, uh, I was born in the Congo. And that only makes sense because, you know, you, you don't want to be born in Iceland because you wouldn't survive. So I had her born in the Congo and I bring her up to date and I bring her son, which I've always loved. Uh, I love history. I love the idea that Hannibal brought the, um, as we know, the elephants brought him over the Alps and that's how he defeated Rome. So I just wanted to bring things like that in to, to show. And uh, there's a song there that nobody knows really. There's a pianist named Edward, uh, Ed um, Hayward. And he, he, the song is Soft Summer Day. It's really a nice song. And uh, I have him, when, when we're, we're having Jonah, is not Jonah, who did that? Um, yeah, Jonah is, is, uh, is, is, the water is rising. And so I, I'm standing on the, on the helm and uh, listening to a soft summer day. So I've got some jazz in there. And I've got, I enjoyed, I enjoyed writing that poem. And of course, I, I still think, and, and there are theories, and I, I, wouldn't, I would not disagree with the theories, that the theory is that human beings are still, and I say still because I think we always have been jealous of birds. We're not jealous of fish because there's a theory that says actually we evolved from sardines. And I like that theory. What it did to me though, as I was doing, I, I, I do science all the time, I'm not a scientist, but what bothered me when I was reading that book, uh, it's, it's a Frenchman who, who wrote it, uh, I forget his name now, I'm so sorry, and hit the eloquence of the sardine. And he, his position is that we evolved from the sardine. And as I started reading this about halfway through, I went to my cupboard and I, I have a pantry, I should say. And I used to like sardines. And I went to my and I took all of my sardines out and I had to throw it away because eating a sardine now is like eating your grandmother. I just can't do it because <laughs> <laughs> it made so much sense. But we're not jealous of fish. We are, but we are still, we remain jealous of the birds because birds can fly and we cannot. We can swim. We can do a lot of things, but we cannot fly. We have to fly in something or on something. And I think that's why we still don't mind. Right now, uh, speaking of Earth Day, we don't mind keeping uh, wind, those wind chimes, those wind things. And we, we killed 140 eagles recently because they ran into it. Or somebody here is from Pittsburgh uh, and, and God bless Pittsburgh and, and Philadelphia because both of them are doing night, uh, their lights out. And I'm sure you're aware of that. And what they're doing was with the tall buildings, they're now, as we watch the, the migration, they're now asking, and, and the people are, be, are going, they're, they're, they're following through on it, to turn your lights down because the, the birds are migrating. And what would look like, what would look like the sky, because it reflects on the glass, makes them fly into it and it kills them. So you end up in the morning, you know, sweeping away 400 birds and, and that's supposed to be okay. And we are now becoming aware that we have to take care of the birds. And I, I do, I, I think we're jealous of the birds. And I, I think that maybe human beings being fools that we are, will we'll never get over it. But that doesn't give us the right to be indifferent. Does that make sense, Paul? Just because, yeah, I mean, yeah, just because they can do something we can't do, we are, we are not allowed to be indifferent to their, 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 their safety. And, and it's ridiculous, you get a 17 story building and it's all glass. Well, of course the bird is gonna, gonna fly into it. 
what else? It, it, it doesn't understand that. And so it's our responsibility. If you're going to bother the sky, <laughs> which is what we're doing, then you have to at least put something there to let the birds, you know, know this is here. Please don't bump into it. Please don't kill yourself. We love you. Wow. That, that was a freestyle verse right there. I, I, I was thinking of how would I put that to music? I can imagine like um, that was like a free, free verse mixed with like both technical ar architectural references mixed with dimensionality and the idea of biological kind of uh, uncertainty about the role of, of how, uh, to me, what you were just saying is that it, it let me know if I'm mischaracterizing this. To me, at least language is one of the most powerful tools that human beings have ever made. Uh, stronger than fire, stronger than anything else. It allows us to create worlds with um, the imagination. And what you just did right there, <laughs> I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, it's, it's incredible to see in the 21st century how language has become so encoded with an algorithmic and or digital context. But when I hear you speak, I really think about the complexity of the political context that you, you were uh, coming out of and the Black Arts Movement in the 60s and um, your, your show, Soul. Um, I wanted to kind of pivot for just a second to talk about the show. Um, for those in the audience, uh, Nikki had a show in the 1970s where she had all sorts of incredible people come on. Um, Muhammad Ali, James Baldwin, uh, Jesse Jackson, uh, Harry Belafonte, Mary McCabe, uh, yeah, and of course, Stevie Wonder, the, the, uh, the legend. And the conversations were cool. There's one conversation I saw that you did with uh, Muhammad Ali, where he's just talking about raising his kids and like you guys, are, you guys start getting into a, almost a poetic dimension of how framing his family structure inflected in the poetry because he would he would rap while he was boxing and exercising. And um, you also are really into Tupac. I remember reading this as well. Can, Tupac and Muhammad Ali are two different energies, but I would love to hear you as someone interviewing the people in Seoul, you got people to really open up and then the poetic, poetic dimension of how you did that um, was really powerful. Um, and in the audience, if anybody from the Brooklyn Rail, if you could just look up Nikki's name plus uh, Soul plus Muhammad Ali on, on YouTube, you'll see what I'm talking about. But can you riff on that for a second? Just like how the show started, what got you into that? Because it's not every day you have a, a poet hosting a show. I mean, it's really, it's a whole different world. Well, I need to correct something. I don't correct people, but I need to correct this. The show actually uh, was Ellis Hazlett and Ellis oh, okay. used to work on, on Broadway. And Ellis and I were friends. He had, uh, when he started the show, he wasn't sure who he wanted. He, Ellis had a stutter and he wasn't, he didn't think that he could be the host because he thought he's got this and you'll see it. If you listen to it, you'll, you see that. He thought, well, nobody will, will want to listen to me. And, and so he asked um, um, Alvin Poussaint, Dr. Poussaint from Harvard, because he thought, well, if I have a Harvard professor, it'll work. Well, of course it didn't. I mean, there's nothing, and, and I, I know Al, and, and I like him. It's not that, it's that he, you needed somebody on the show who loved the people who were gonna come on. And Poussaint is a PhD, he's Dr. Poussaint, and he's gonna approach things in that doctoral way. And so it didn't work. I mean, the second week of the show, anybody that looked at it could see this isn't working. And Ellis came by my house because we talked you know, regularly, but he came by, and I say my apartment, because I was living uptown. And he said, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. Why don't you think about hosting the show? And I said, oh, I can't host the show because actually, and it is true, I don't have that much interest in people. And so I'm, I'm, a, I don't, I'm a bad, I'm a bad artist on that. I, I can watch, but I don't, I, I really can't. You, you know, Ellis did a wonderful job or you, you know, you bring up questions, you do. But um, as I said, I'm not, I said, Ellis, it's your show. And you're the one who loves everybody on it. So why don't you do it? And he said, nobody will, will like me. He said, I'm gay and I have a stutter. And I said, no, you have a television. <laughs> and everybody, <laughs> no matter what you think, and you look good because he was, he was, he really always dressed so beautifully. I said, everybody will love you. And his friend and our friend, and she's passed and we miss her, Novella Nelson, who was a Broadway actress, and you probably know <clears throat> Novella. And Novella said to Ellison, he, they were very close. What we need to be sure we do is that we treat this show with a lot of respect. And so we had someone to dress and, and, and she was right about that. We just made a, a budget so that we can dress the people who are coming on the show so that we can comb their hair and make up their faces. And of course, when you came into the studio, we had 
food, you know. So we, we, we made it like an Ed Sullivan show or like being on the, um, mm -hmm. in the old days, the, the Today Show. We wanted to make sure that everybody was, was treated respectfully and that they knew that. And to that degree, I did help, but it was, it was so it was not mine. I, I just happened to love it. And we did a, a wonderful job because I didn't mind asking anybody. And Muhammad Ali and I were friends. And so it's really funny because my son <laughs> used to run around and call him Hamad Ali. And uh, <laughs> we, were, we were in the studio at one point and we were, I was interviewing uh, Ali and Thomas was running around like little boys do. And Ali only had daughters at that point. His, his, his brother just wrote a book about it. And it was so funny because finally Thomas got on Ali's nerve because Tom, you know, he's running around the studio and he just picked him up, you know, grabbed him and hit his behind. <laughs> now, you know, he's not trying to hurt him obviously. And Thomas wasn't used to it because I've never hit Thomas. And he came back over to me. He said, mommy, mom, him and Ali hit me. And I said, well, Thomas, you know, that's up to you men. Just don't, don't come back to me with any of that crap because I was doing something else. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he thought about it and he went back over to Ali. You know, Ali's 6'5", you know, he's, Ali's a big man. Thomas is seven years old. And Tom said, Ali, him and Ali. And Ali looked down and said, what now, Thomas? Because he was like sick of it. And Thomas <laughs> put back his fist and he hit him in the knee because that's about as far as he could go. <laughs> It was so funny. I was so, I, I, I was looking at uh, his brother's book and I thought, oh, I didn't realize that, that story was going to make its way into the, um, into the book. But um, mm -hmm. that was, that was too funny. But Ali, Ali's next child, because, you know, he had a bunch of children, but his next child was a boy. And of course, once he got a son, he began to understand why Thomas was, because girls don't do that. You know, you take a girl to a movie studio, she sits down. And, you know, she behaves, you know, may I have a drink of water? You know, girls just don't do that. But boys are just running around like crazy. So I was so glad when he finally had a son so he could understand what all of us were going through. And we got to laugh about that. And Ali and I did not only Soul, but we did the Today Show together. We did a bunch of things together. And we traveled for a while when they took his uh, uh, belt. Uh, and, and he was trying to figure out what to do with himself because he had a lot to give. He was still... Cassius Clay. He was becoming uh, Muhammad Ali at that point. And so uh, his, his person, who was uh, Victoria Lucas, who handled his publicity, said, you know, would you like to, would you like to, to travel? It might be good for, for Ali to learn. Ali was used to being an athlete, and now he's going to have to learn to, to speak, to be on stage. And that's what I do. And I said, I'd be delighted. You know, I mean, not a problem with me. And Ali traveled by bus, and I had to travel by, by uh, by plane because I had to be where I had to be. And so we would we would travel around. I remember being in Ohio State and it was a big crowd. And Ali's like, oh, you're gonna, you know, what am I gonna say? I said, go out there and say what you wanna say. You're Ali and they're not. <laughs> don't, don't, don't worry about it. And of course everybody loved him. But I think it our our the tour that we had together, and it was a it wasn't like a you know million years, it was just a couple of years, a, a year. But us being together and him being on stage, I think was um learning to be comfortable with speaking. I think that was a big help as he went forward because um, he definitely had something to say. And I think being on stage, not in a ring, helped him learn that, oh yeah, I can say this. I enjoyed it. And, I, and his wife and I got along. I got along with him, his wife and, and, and I got along. And uh, that was the main thing. You know, you if you're going to travel with a man, you, you have to get along with his wife or otherwise there are problems. <laughs> and so we yep, did. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I, so, I really, I, I loved him. And, and he was always, again, he's somebody that was always very, very kind. And he's very kind to, to my son. And uh, I think that that was uh, important that, that he, he began to learn a little bit about boys. And then he finally had one and he, he, then he learned a lot. <laughs> Okay. Well, that's a crazy, I mean, that's an, a powerful story. I mean, giving, giving help or helping Muhammad Ali be, um, sort of manifest his poetry or his style of speech. Cause you know, the, the, the famous phrase sting like a bee, uh, you know, it's, but that's one of his classic, you know, lines like, you know, uh, he, he, he combined kind of an early form of rap with the physicality and I, I, did, I know that you guys had toured together and you had him on your show. The interview on your show was amazing, or the show. I mean, sorry, I, I, I apologize oh, I, I, about that. Yeah. The Hazlip, uh, it's Hazlip Ellis. 
Yeah. Um, thank you for the correction. I appreciate that. Um, so okay. So from teaching Muhammad Ali how to like do his poems to um some of your early work, let's pivot for a second to the black arts movement because obviously uh Amiri Baraka, the beat poets. Uh, Allen Ginsberg, uh, Jack Kerouac, all those guys were slightly in a different angle to the scene. And you and the last poets, you and the last poets came along and had the whole scene sort of pivot in that late 60s, early 70s moment. Do you have any thoughts on that, of the two different movements, the beat poetry movement versus the black arts movement or uh, bridging between Amiri Baraka, your work and the last poets? Well, of course, you know, Baraka started off as Leroy Jones. Mm -hmm. And I, I got to meet him when uh, I was at Fisk University and uh, I was a senior, I had gotten kicked out of school and I was out for a year and then I came back in and graduated, which was very good because what you're gonna do if you don't graduate from college, <laughs> you know, what am I going to do? And so I, mm -hmm. I did go back, but we hired, I'm saying we, this university had some money and uh, the Dean whom I uh, adored, uh, Jackie Cowan, wonderful woman. And she had a lot to do with helping me just to be sane. And uh, she wanted me to be a part of, of the, the group. She said, you know, we have some money, we're gonna hire a writer. And I, you know, Nikki, I thought you might wanna be a part of that group. And we, we did, we hired John Killens and John Oliver Killens. And then we heard the thunder and uh, um, uh, the cotillion or one good bull is worth half the, he's written a lot of wonderful books, but we hired John and John's, uh, which was very smart of John, John's uh, position was I'll come if you'll admit my daughter and his daughter's name was Barbara. And so rather than her having, he didn't want her, not that anything was wrong with Spellman or anyplace else, but he wanted Barb to be with, with him. So Fisk said, I mean, it was obvious that was easy. He's like, yeah. And so when John came down, John knew everybody. He's gone now and that's, that's sad too. But we were talking about, gosh, wouldn't it be nice if, <laughs> wouldn't it be nice if Gwendolyn Brooks came? Wouldn't it be nice if, if Leroy Jones came? And so John said, well, why don't we have a, why don't we have a festival? So one of the first big college festivals was started at Fisk University uh, by, by John Killens. And I was just a part of helping him do that. But I remember we, we had it in, in Jubilee Hall. There's a, and the hall is a long, it's just, it, sound, it is what it is, it's a hall. And we were sitting there listening to other people read poetry and we were being, everybody said, we is Fisk and the community that, that had come. And Leroy came in. And everybody just started screaming because he had that, you know, up against the wall, motherfucker, this is a stick up. You know? And everybody knew that point. And we all started screaming. And of course, later he's gonna change his name and he's gonna become um, Amir Baraka. And of course, uh, the, uh, the Spirit House was in, um, in Newark. And I lived in, as did most people, I lived in um, uh, Manhattan and uh, John lived in, um, and I guess the house is still there. As a matter of fact, uh, I don't know who owns it now, but John lived in Brooklyn, you know, because in those days, if you bought a house in Brooklyn, you could afford it. You, I, I don't think Brooklyn is particularly affordable now, but in those days, a lot of people, uh, Novella had a house, had a home uh, in, in, uh, in Brooklyn. John had a home in Brooklyn. A lot of people purchased homes in Brooklyn because they, I don't, they were not cheap. They're, they're you know, big homes, but, uh, you could afford it you could, because you couldn't afford Manhattan. Nobody could uh, purchase a home in Manhattan. Not, not anybody like us, no, but not, not Harlem or any place that you couldn't afford it. And so that's how I got to know Brooklyn. I still, if I was in Manhattan right now, I probably couldn't find my way <laughs> to, to Brooklyn because I'm, I'm geographically challenged. And I lived in New York for, for 20 years and never once got on a subway. <laughs> and I got teased about that. I would walk if I couldn't take uh, uh, a cab. Sometimes you didn't have money for cab. Otherwise you would walk. But I, if, if you don't mind, I'll share this one story. I, mm -hmm. I was going to, I had a reading and I needed to be at uh, LaGuardia at the airport. And as you did for me <laughs> just a minute ago, it didn't bother me. I'm not saying, but you know, you're always, poets are always running late. I think the only people that are on time <laughs> are, the, are the athletes. Everybody else runs late. And I had left home, I lived on 92nd Central Park West, and I had left home too late. And it's very hard to get a, a, a taxi 
at that hour at about four o'clock in New York, it's pretty much impossible. So I walked through Central Park because I'm on the other side. I walked through Central Park and I was walking because usually in Central in, in uh, Fifth Avenue, once you get across the, the uh, park, you're in, uh, you're in Fifth Avenue and there's usually a cab on Fifth Avenue. And I was walking down Fifth Avenue, you know, looking for a cab. And all of a sudden a limousine pulled up and the window went down and somebody said, Javon, Javon. And I looked over. It's me, Miles, baby. You safe? Where are you going? You safe? <laughs> I will never forget that. That is a quote on Miles. And I looked up and it was Miles. It was Mr. Davis. And I said, I have to go to LaGuardia, Mr. Davis. He's coming. I'll take you. I'll take you. Now, he didn't drive, as you know. But he had his, his uh, that's how I met him. His uh, driver took me to, to, uh, to LaGuardia. And it was so great wow. because Cecily Tyson, his wife, of course, was my um, sorority sister. Cecily is a well, she, she too has passed, but uh, well, uh, a Delta, she was my sorority sister. But it was so funny because I'll never forget. And I don't know why he said that. You safe? I know, you, you know how Miles talk. You safe, uh -huh. you safe, baby. I just <laughs> <laughs> you're, just, you're blowing my mind. All right, so it's from Muhammad <laughs> Ali to Miles Davis pulling up in a limousine and giving a ride. I mean, that's, yeah. most people would just be like, wow, Miles Davis, just, just Miles Davis. But he stops and gives you a ride. That's like a... <laughs> Yeah. I love the fact that you're the way that you tell stories there there's an infusion of poetic kind of dimensionality to it all and the fun part about some of the arts movement of that time especially the obviously the Nixon administration was in power the Vietnam war was raging uh you had everybody from Hendrix on over to you know the 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 temptations had just done a series of songs like psychedelic shack uh which was kind of their a classic album um, also, of course, even George Clinton with Parliament Funkadelic was releasing kind of psychedelic albums. How was your take on the counterculture at that time? Because I feel like the hippies, uh, the poets, uh, the poets of kind of like uh, downtown, uh, people like Allen Ginsberg, William S. Burroughs, there was, your, your intersection with both the jazz scene and the counterculture um, was really, it's, it's a powerful legacy. And I just wanted to have you maybe riff on that a little bit because the Vietnam War obviously changed the course of a lot of the culture of resistance. And of course the Black Panthers were being uh, persecuted by J. Edgar Hoover. Could you talk a little bit about the political context of some of the, po the, the po po poetry you're working on? No, I didn't really know uh, many people downtown. I, I, I lived Midtown, I, I, my home, at that point I, um, I moved from Amsterdam Avenue because I had, was living on Amsterdam Avenue and speaking of people, my next door neighbor in Amsterdam, uh, it was a big apartment building, was Morgan Freeman. And he was married to Jeannie at that time. And they had a daughter and her name was um, uh, Dina. And Morgan being an actor or wanting to be an actor at that point as he was developing his career, would come and knock on my door. It'd be like, you know, nine o'clock in the morning and I'm trying to write or get something done. And he'd knock on the door. And so you, I knew it's Morgan. What is he? I said, what's up? Said, what you What you doing? Are you busy? And I said, Morgan, I'm writing. Well, since you're not busy, can I? Because <laughs> that's the way he looked at writing. Since you're not busy, I'll never forget that. And I have seen him. I see him. <laughs> I said, Morgan, it's unforgivable that you would actually say, since you're not busy, what kind, right. what kind of actor are you if I don't write, you know? But it, it was really funny, but he was my next door neighbor. But I moved up uptown to 92nd and Central Park West, which is right there. I, I never had the pleasure of living in um, Harlem because actually Harlem became, and it's still, as you know, pretty much um, unaffordable. That, that, that there are a lot of things that, that New York should do for, um, for Harlem. But I didn't know the downtown people, uh, the, the person, or I should say the two people that I probably knew best for downtown was Nina Simone used to be down and you would run into Nina Simone at, uh, in Harlem actually, at a bookstore called Michelle's Bookstore, which is how I met Nina. And I met her uh, one day, I don't remember which day, and I was there at the bookstore and she was there and it was like, oh my gosh, that Nina Simone. And you know how you go like, oh, okay, how are you? I'm, I'm a poet, you know, you just, you know, because I'm such a fan. And I said, I'm uh -huh. having, because I was, my mother was coming up. I said, my mother's coming to New York and I'm having a party, you know, and would love to have you come if you're not busy. And you know how you say that? And people say things like, okay. And she said, well, what's your address? And so I wrote it down and she said, well, I'll see you. And, you know, you never thought you'd see her again. And there was, I know the party was a Sunday 
And when the doorbell rang, we had a lot of people in and the doorbell rang and everybody, I mean, you could have heard a pin drop. Everybody turned and it was Nina Simone. And my mother was just thrilled. Oh, so you are doing okay. If you know important people like Nina Simone. Right. You, you this is wild. Know, right? <laughs> well, I, I love your, the politics of the everyday. I mean, and one, one of the things I keep seeing as a refrain in your work is that it's about people and that community sensibility. But also these are very high level, hard, you know, people from my generation, and Morgan Friedman, Nina Simone, Miles Davis, Muhammad Ali. These are like, you know, legends. And for you, you kind of just like have Morgan Freeman coming knock on your door and saying, are you busy? Um, I do want to kind of rip with you about the politics of it all a little bit, because much of your work was viewed as a kind of, you know, for everything from the NAACP Image Awards and the other award, many of the awards you've received have been about the way that your poetry gave people, I think at least, a better definition of how uh, we can rethink a progressive notion of African-American and afro diaspora culture. Um, do you want to riff about some of the politics of that time a little bit? Just like I mean, everybody was being, I mean, J. Edgar Hoover was on the Black Panthers like crazy. Um, obviously, the Vietnam War, those were two very powerful sort of pincer movements right now. Uh, did you see the film Judas and the Black um, Messiah? No. Um, it's, it was about so the Black Panthers and the, the, the FBI had, had informers. And it's a film that shows like a, a, an informer. But it's really, it's a very poetic film. I'll, I'll, I'll send you an email about it. Okay. But um, do you want to riff about some of the politics going on at that time? Because there was the Black Arts Movement was under immense pressure uh, from the, the culture at large, or at least that's what you, the impression. I would love to hear your first person take on that. Well, I, I think that you're only under pressure if you allow what people have to say or think or what they think they can do with you to mm -hmm. do that. Uh, we didn't spend, and I'm saying we, because there was the West Coast and there was the East Coast, and then there was the Chicago group, right? And so we all, we being the East Coasters, New York and the people in Chicago, we ended up always gravitating toward, um, uh, in my opinion, you, you, there are some others you could ask, but we gravitated toward uh, Detroit because the music was gonna be in Detroit. Dudley Randall had uh, Broadside Press was in Detroit. And um, there's a wonderful, restaurant is gone now and I'm so sad about that and Aretha sang about it called Maddie's and you know whenever you were looking for try Maddie early in the morning Ray, Ray Charles also sang about Maddie's and so if you were in Detroit looking for somebody you either went to Broadside Press or you went to Maddie's and that was great so the the time that we spent or that I spent in California, I had and have and, and will always have a great love and respect for the Black Panthers because everybody wants to forget that the Panthers started, which other people have now taken up, the breakfast program for kids. We now see other people dealing with, you know, yeah, breakfast program for, for school kids is important, but it was the Black Panthers who started that. And it's an amazing thing to me because America is such a hypocritical nation anyway, that when we had the Black Panthers in Sacramento just holding their rifles, they weren't even pointing them at somebody. Everybody, Hoover and them all were upset. But on January the 6th, when we had people attacking the, the capital of the United States, those same hypocritical lying Republicans are saying, well, they didn't really mean anything. They killed people, <laughs> they never, never did. Yeah. You know, you get sick of that. But uh, Huey Newton was a great man. Bobby, Bobby Rush was a great man. And what they did to bring people together, they, they were great men. And going to uh, LA particularly and Oakland, and um, when the Black Panther movie came out, which everybody liked, and I, I saw it, so it wasn't like I disliked it. But to me, when you say Black Panthers, you're saying Oakland. And so hmm. I, I, I uh, resisted and, and still do the idea that the Black Panther was something with some special material in, in Africa that's going to allow this nation to be really, really rich and can do everything. Because to me, Black Panthers are the young men and women in Oakland who tried to change and did have a lot to do with changing California. And what change, as goes California, so goes uh, the nation. Uh, Mr. Brown, uh, uh, Brown, what is Brown? Jerry Brown was the governor. And so Jerry Brown, you could run into him because he hung out with the movie stars. And 
<laughs> you always, you know, you're always, if you're in California, you know, you're going to do Hollywood and you're going to do all of that section. And so that's uh, important. I'm not a LA fan as much as I am San Francisco, but I will always have uh, such a respect actually for what, what uh, the Panthers did. And I, I still think, and I haven't seen the movie you, you've, you're mentioning, but what they did was to create and show people this not only can be done, but has to be done. We have to feed the youngsters. I have a, my car is old and uh, I'm going to keep this car until it just one day I'm going to go out and I put the key in. It's going to say, Nikki, I'm not going, you know, and that'll be that. But I have a, a, a sign on the back and it says, no farms, no food. And I think that we have to appreciate what the Panthers did in showing people we can take care of these youngsters going to school. And if there's one thing that people like me, uh, our time in many respects has passed. We're, we're not running for office or something. But what we want the senators and people to do is one number one, school teachers, kindergarten through 12th grade need to be paid adequate fare, adequate price, uh, adequate money. They are underpaid, which is terrible because I live in a state where school teachers have two jobs. They teach and then they go out and get another job so that they can buy pens and pencils for, for their students. And the people sitting in, 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 in Congress and sitting in the House of Representatives just voted themselves recently a raise and they don't do diddly squat. And I think that that's a damn shame. I think we need to take money away from those sin because I think they're all liars anyway. And most of them are stupid, just like we know most of the Supreme Court is stupid. And so we need to take that money away. Let them, let them live off of what the school teachers make. Let them live off of, of, of what the librarians make. Let them live off of what the nurses make because they, they, they don't do anything nearly as good. Let them live off of what the firemen, because I'm a fan of firemen. Firemen, I'm not, the, I'm not a fan of policemen because I'm a black woman and I've just been around too long to be, I'm not against, I'm not trying to hurt any cop, but I'm just not a fan. But I am a big fan <laughs> of the firemen. And the firemen go, they run into the house, not just to get you and me out, but we've seen them go into the house to get your cat or your dog. We, we, we've seen firemen do incredibly brave and wonderful things. Let somebody live. I, I live in an area where the fire department is, is, is voluntary. What kind of sense does that make? That we have a senator, not a senator, excuse me, we have a House of Representative Morgan, who is a stupid, evil man. And he, <laughs> that is the nicest that I can probably say on this screen. And he okay. gets paid. And yet, if my house catches on fire, Representative Morgan doesn't give a damn. It's going to be my neighbor down the street, the fire department. They're going to come and try to help me and my dog. They're going to try to save the people who are in the house. And, and I, I think, you know, we, we, we have some things turned around because what is called leaders, they're not leaders. They're, they're just greedy, old, and, and, and I mean no disrespect here, but greedy old white men who are just trying to look out for themselves. And it's time that this country looked like it's supposed to. We're supposed to be uh, a, a country of, of many different people. And I just saw that Joe Biden, which I think is disgraceful, has allowed the Ukrainians from Europe to come to the United States. But if they come through Mexico, nobody can come through the, 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 the southern border, which is to say we're not letting the brown people in. We're going to only let the white people in. And, you know, that's a damn shame. As if these no. people coming from South America, coming from Latin America, coming from places where they've, they've been flooding, where they've been fires, where they're hungry, where there are fights going on. And we say, well, no, we don't want anybody coming up through our southern border. But the people coming through our, our European, through, through, through our European uh, allies, through, our, through Canada or through Europe, we'll, we'll let them in. And what kind of sense does that make? Joe no, Biden every, every, himself. Yeah, everything that you just mentioned. The eerie thing is like, how do you think of poetry as helping us change the the perception of things? Because language, I mean, which you are a master of, I mean, you're an incredibly powerful poet. How do you feel that poetry can give us better tools to, to critique? I mean, just what you said right there about the stupid evil man. <laughs> I was like, who, which one? Hmm. Yeah. So many. Where, where, to be, where, 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 where to begin? Um, but how do you feel like the role of language is evolving right now? Because obviously that 60s moment, I remember going to a, a used bookstore in Washington, D.C. 
and I got the vinyl of your, um, you did this thing with the community choir. Yeah, uh, this is an old school, old, yeah. yeah, it's a great record. I have the vinyl of that. <laughs> and I got it when I was like maybe 13. And I'd read um, Samuel Delaney and Octavia Butler, uh, grabbed a copy of one of your vinyls at this, at P Street Books, which is a really good bookstore in DC. I don't know if you remember this one. It's off a of DuPont Circle. Uh, yeah. Kramer Books. You, any, okay. I know Kramer. I would have never books, uh huh. If you're in Virginia, a lot of people will come in just because these are really good bookstores. Um, now they have Busboys and Poets, which is a little bit of a different. Well, um, oh, Andy and I are friends. And of course, she's extended Busboys and Poets. You know, he's in now into Maryland and stuff. <laughs> and I always, uh, whenever Andy calls, um, I always go because okay. uh, I think he's doing something for the community. And I think that he is a businessman because you can't be in business unless you do business. But he also <laughs> reaches out to the community. No, I mean, you know, he, did that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, but let's talk about poetry and, and power, because I think that's what, uh, at the end of the day, your work really empowers people. Um, and that's, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. How do you think words work to give people that sensibility of change and transformation? How do you think uh, poetry can help us uh, rethink uh, possibility? Just putting that out there. I think communication helps us. And so I'm not sure that poet, you know, you've never seen me and never will trying to lead the people as they say, trying to tell the people what to do or any of that because I don't believe in that. All I have are words. And so I try to keep my words authentic and, and honest. And I think that the people know that I care about them very much, but I'm not gonna lie to the people and I'm not going to lie to myself. I just write and hopefully somebody reads and, and I'm happy that uh, that they do. But I don't think you can start off your, your life saying, I'm gonna be a poet, I'm gonna change the world because that doesn't make sense to me. What you have to do is, is to make sure that the world does not change you. And of that, I am sure. The world will not ever change me. So for the people that I think are stupid and evil, I'm gonna say that. I'm not gonna let somebody think, well, if I say that I won't get a job or they won't put me on the cover of the magazine, no. Stupid and evil people should be called stupid and evil. And so I do that because that's what they are. It means nothing to me. I, I, okay. I sincerely have no fear of ever being hungry or sleeping on the streets. And, and it's not that I'm nice or, or that I have good friends, it's just that I don't believe it. And I, I know that if you let that get into your head, like golly, I shouldn't tell this story. I shouldn't say this about this person. Once you get it in your head, I'll lose my job or something bad, right? you're, you're gone. You, you, you have nothing to give. And so what you have to do is never worry. You, somebody will take you in. And so, cause there's always somebody, you just have to you know, let yourself find. Somebody will feed you. Somebody will say, well, come on over and, and let's get a cup of coffee or come on over, let's have a bowl of soup. Somebody is there. And I don't know what color or what race or what, what uh, 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 religion, I don't know, but I know, I do believe, and I will always believe, that there is somebody. And once you realize that no matter where you are, there is somebody, then you're free to be what you think you should be. I like that. You're free to be who you think you should be. That's, that's a, a, these are, I mean, I just love hearing you, when you're speaking, I, my brain is kind of just processing, connecting a lot of um, associative dots, kind of like a pointless painting made from the philosophy of Nikki Giovanni here. Um, and so one thing I've always wanted to ask you is the, the role of the arts. Okay, so painters paint, poets write poetry, they speak. Do you feel that there's an interdisciplinary approach right now, um, especially because a lot of your work is both associative and alludes to many, like uh, when you talk about like Hannibal bringing the elephants or, you know, I'm so hip, even my errors are correct. Uh, again, from that poem, Ego Trippin' for the audience. If you haven't heard Ego Trippin', I have a quick, I would love to hear your thoughts. If you were, the idea for DJ culture, I come out of what they call remix culture. So like, I remember you were really into Tupac and you, you've, didn't, you've done several things about Tupac. Um, he sampled a lot of, you know, soul music records, um, you know, him and Dr. Dre, California Lovin', stuff like that. What are your thoughts on some of the more current hip hop uh, approach to things? Because I mean, that's, I think that, it, 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 that song Ego Trip is definitely the DNA of our moment um, in a powerful way. I mean, really, really enabling and empowering. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on some of the, 
the lyricism that you feel evolves between generations. And then maybe we can just pivot to how your thoughts on hip hop and more of the, the current uh, spoken word movements that inherit your, your legacy. Well, I'm, I'm very you know, proud, of course, of, of the hip hop generation. And they took the next step. I am a big fan, of course, of spirituals. And I just completed, which I, I do love, I just completed a, an, an album with uh, Javon Jackson. And Javon used to play saxophone with uh, 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 Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. And he now teaches up in, uh, in Hartford. He's a uh, runs a school up there, uh, one of the schools at the university. And I just happened to meet him and we were talking and I was saying, oh, I really love the spirituals. One thing led to another. And he said, you know, we ought to do something together. And I said, like, yeah, because people say things like that to you all the time. And I said, yeah, you know, you know, give me a, shoot an email. I don't email. But um, my friend, Jimmy, I don't. I, it, it, it's, it's no wonder that people commit suicide. You start to get on looking at that stuff and make you crazy. But uh, <laughs> OK, but uh, we did. We, we went back and forth and uh, he told he, he uh, emailed Jenny and said, you know, Nikki said you do it. Send them send, uh, you know, tell her to send me 10 poems. And what I did was I sent 12. But one of those, you know, so that he could throw a couple out. But one of the songs that I sent was not a spiritual. It was um, a song called Night Song. And it was, uh, as I said to you earlier, Nina Simone was a, a dear friend. And um, losing her was very sad. To, to lose Nina was very sad. And, you know, you always hope that you're a good sister and you always hope that you're there to be helpful. And then some things that you can't. So, you know, she went to Europe and, you know, um, we, we know that we lost Nina. But one of her favorite songs uh, that I was aware of was a song called Night Song. And it's a song from, uh, it's a theme actually from Golden Boy starring Sammy Davis Jr. And it's kind of funny because, you know, Mr. Davis, you know, must have weighed 50 pounds and he's playing a boxer. So <laughs> you can see where, that, where that's right. going. But I wanted, I wanted Night Song in this, if we were going to do something together, I wanted Night Song. And I can't sing. And so, it's still, I, I said to Javon, uh, the only thing I really want, if, if I'm gonna, if we can work together, I wanna sing Night Song because I want, I want to think that, that Nina is sitting in heaven, having a drink and listening to me try to sing. I know she's laughing because she's got a great voice, <laughs> but I, okay. I just wanna, I just wanna do that. He said, well, she might not be laughing. I said, Nina's laughing, but I'm gonna sing it anyway because I've been laughed at before. <laughs> so what does what it sound like? I've been duped and I've been scorned. So I'm not gonna let that bother me. So on the album, which they entitled, I did not entitle the album, but the album is entitled um, uh, the, the Gospel According to Nikki Giovanni. It's, it's Javon Jackson and the, uh, the album and, and the Gospel According to Nikki Giovanni, which is very nice to them. I had nothing to do with the title, but I do sing uh, Night Song. And I wanted to do that for um, for Nina, and you know, I'm not I'm not ever going to be a singer. So I'm not going to make a habit of it or any of that stuff. But some things you do because it's important to be done. And one of the things I loved about I still love about spirituals is that you don't have to have a good voice to sing them. You know, you have to have a good <laughs> voice to, to sing other things, but you don't have to. You know, you have to be Ella Fitzgerald or something to sing some of the uh, George Gershwin or you know some of that stuff. But to, to, to do what, what, what we were doing, you don't have to have a good voice. And of course he plays a beautiful saxophone. So we enjoyed bringing, uh, he's looking at the spirituals and he's bringing them up to date with the exception of, of course, um, Night Song because Night Song is, uh, um, is a show tune that, that I wanted, but it also fit in with the songs that we were doing, leaning on the everlasting arms or, you know, uh, uh, it is well with my soul. And, and Night Song fit in with that. And uh, Javon hadn't heard Night Song because it's not something you hear, it wasn't a big hit. And he said, you know, it does fit. I said, thanks Javon, it, it really works. So we got that done. And I'm, I'm very proud of that. But you asked me, what did I think about the, the, the younger group? Well, I'm not listening to, to them probably as much as I, as I should. I, um, I'm, I'm still, you know, listening to, to Bud Powell. <laughs> I'm still listening to Brez, to, to, to Lester Young. You know, I'm still listening, of course, to Jesse Norman, if I want to hear some gospel or, or some spirituals, I should say. I'm listening to Moses <clears throat> Hogan. You know, I'm, I, my music probably doesn't go much further than uh, Tupac. And it probably just comes up. Pac was a great man. And he's been dead, what, 15 years now? 
and and we're still yeah, yeah. we're always going to be talking about uh, and and some people we, we won't talk about anymore some of them we've already forgotten and uh, as it is said you are not dead until you're forgotten and some of that group that came up with with Pac, they are forgotten they are dead but Pac could be with us forever because he he stood for something and he he didn't back off of anything he's a he's a great man and great great people are, are difficult to come by and we we remember them because we we who loved them we continue to talk about what they had to give and we continue to appreciate and love what they gave to us okay that i mean these are incredible insights about both um there's a there's a way that when you describe something it automatically makes my mind start thinking of um kind of visualizing it and, and i i just think that um you've worked with choirs before that was one of the pieces that um you know the the album with the community choir the issue for me at least i got I, i'm going to download that album as soon as we wrap up because i actually um there i think that's very recent right like, and i think you're going to be doing something at bam or did that already happen yeah no it, it, i think it's going to happen in june in june okay yeah yeah we're um to it. yeah yeah, I'll make sure to I'll let people know about that because I think that will be. You're going to present this project live at BAM. Is that what's happening? Uh, well, it it, it was uh, released, uh, and again now I, I I did what I'm doing. So this is on Javon Jackson, how he puts things together, and I'm just working with Javon. But we're going to be at BAM. I think on June 10th or 11th or 10th and 11th. We were going to be there with a British singer, and she canceled her American um, uh, tour. And so we're in a, uh, Javon tried to explain it to me that we're in a smaller uh, auditorium than they had planned. Well, I'm glad because I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm a poet. So I, I don't want one of those, you know, 20,000 things and people get trampled trying to get to you or something. I, I, I think that that's, uh, I think that's disgraceful. You're, you're trying to talk to people, but then I don't like churches that have, you know, 2,500 people and the churches that I went to all, you knew everybody in church Everybody mm -hmm. in church knew you and your business. So <laughs> you always had mm -hmm. to be careful what you were doing. And you knew that whatever you were doing is gonna get back to your mother, your grandmother, or somebody. I mean, you know, <laughs> I kind of like that. I, I think that's important okay. that you have a, well, I'm, I'm back to, I, I've always believed and, and probably spoiled by the church to that degree that somebody will take me in. And I, I think the church had an awful lot to do uh, we we grew up in, in in I grew up in the Baptist church. Mommy, my mother was AME because when we moved to Cincinnati, um, there was no Baptist church that was close, so she was African Methodist Episcopal. But uh, both of those churches were were small, and so you knew everybody, you know. And and uh, I think that's important. I, I, I've seen big churches, and you look at them there on television, and everybody says, "Isn't that wonderful?" The preacher's talking with a microphone, and I'm not against anybody believe me and whatever makes you comfortable but I, I like the idea that I know who I'm sitting next to I know that you know Miss Brown had a cold and she's feeling better and I know that oh I should take uh, some dinner over to Miss Scott because she's under the weather a little bit my grandmother would cook dinner and I'd have to walk it over and that's what you mm -hmm. do you, and I think that a lot of youngsters um, don't know that's what you do and take pride in the fact that they do it, that this is how they help people. This is how we know each other. Because the church is a very, very important part of uh, building the community. It's just why the Klan, every time the Klan wanted to send a, a bad message to, to the black community, they'd bomb a church. And we build it back up because um, it, it, as the old song say, you know, ain't gonna uh, let nobody take my religion. And uh, it, it, it's important that you have a community and the church was the community. Okay, well, the, all right. So for me, at least what I just, what I'm hearing is like, you're gonna be doing a show at BAM in one of the halls, but I love the fact you just compare BAM and the idea of your performance as a kind of an update of the church. Um, the poetics of, of, of everything from gospel on over to singing in a choir. Um, the poetry that you layer into that is, is incredible. Um, let's let's pivot for a second and talk about that was a current project um, and moving from Tennessee to Cincinnati and um, there was a whole migration of African Americans from the south to the north um, people like you Maya Angelou um, the list goes on 
Um, she had a famous phrase where she says, when, when someone shows you who they are, believe them, which uh, Hillary Clinton used to say about Trump, actually, which I find hilarious. Um, the eerie thing about politics and poetry, which is I think our time is we're in an era where language is so powerful. Like we're, what's going on in Ukraine, for example, is a, it's a, both a linguistic war, a hacker war and a physical war because they're trying to control perception. Um, and the war that is, you know, it's heartbreaking to see. These are images where everyone has a cell phone now. So they're able to document, show what's going on with the war. Um, but you've been, you've been doing poetry since the mid 60s on up until now. And I I'd just love to ask, each era has a different moment where there's a different energy. Like in, in the 1980s, for example, uh, there was a crack epidemic. Uh, there was, you know, Reagan doing crazy stuff. Uh, the, the end of uh, Jimmy Carter's administration. Uh, Reagan took over and uh, he really cracked down on a lot of stuff. But amusing enough, the only one of the few black people he had at the White House was Miles Davis because he was a huge Miles Davis fan. What do you think of our current moment? Because, I mean, you mentioned Biden. Um, what about Obama? What about, you know, any of the time periods of this, you know, 80s, 90s, on up until now? Is there anything that you feel that poetry took a different dimension? And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Because like, each era, like to me, I view you as like my one of my early vinyl records of your, your, your community choir piece. That is like hardcore late 60s, early 70s. When I think of that moment, I was like, that is her moment. And it's like, wow. But do you feel any updates or like what's, because we just talked about your most recent project. I'm just trying to get a sense of how you feel poetry has evolved over the last, you know, several decades uh, for you. And do you feel that, does it, do the words come from a different area of, of your emotion? And, you know, the, this idea of we're in an era where now where algorithms are like sentiment engines. Um, if you look at Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, everyone is updating, putting their life online at every moment and documenting and, and you know, putting it out. That's a kind of a stream of consciousness narrative. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on the evolution of the last couple of decades from your perspective, just like your poems and the social patterns that those poems reflect. I mean, you just spoke about the church, you spoke about concerts. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Or is that too vague? I'm just trying to. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's it's I meta. Think, so I, well, I, Paul, I think you grow with your 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 work. And of mm -hmm. course, there are things that and I'm 78. There are things at 78 that I didn't know or understand when I was 20. And one of the things that I, I find really interesting, by the way, is that vinyl is making a comeback. And mm -hmm. I hadn't uh, realized, hadn't thought about it actually, that um, Truth is on its way, the, the album you're, you're alluding to, you're making a reference, is, is 50 years old. And it has recently come back out and it, it, there's a gold, um, there's a gold, if you ever you know look it up, there'll be a gold vinyl and the cover, and in the cover, I'm the age of that. Uh, the cover shows me when I was, you know, 28 years old, mm -hmm. which is like uh, every time I look at that, I think, wow, who is that? And I hadn't realized as much as I love it that The Godfather came out the same year. The Godfather's 50 years old, and I absolutely love The Godfather. I absolutely love the way that we looked at how America treated people and what you had to do to work their way out of it. And how Hollywood chose to tell the story of the Corleone family and how they choose to tell the story, Hollywood, of the black community. And I think that, uh, I think Hollywood could do a little better. I, and you haven't asked me, but I really think of all of the crazy mean people on earth Chris Rock would be right up there next to Clarence Thomas. And, and I really just like Clarence Thomas. And I think that what, what, what Chris Rock had to say, no, I'm serious. What he had to say about Jada Smith, mm -hmm. that, that was not funny. She has a condition and that was not funny. And everybody then, I was so disappointed that so many people wanted to say, you know, well, Will Smith, you know, caused this violence. This is Hollywood, 99% of everything that comes out of the movies or television is violence. Nobody made a joke about Alex Baldwin, Alec Baldwin murdering a woman on stage. And that's what he did. He murdered that woman, he shot her and she died. That's called murder. And where was that joke? And I, I, didn't, I didn't get that joke. Nobody had a joke about, uh, uh, what's his name? Epstein and them who are, are, are sexual predators. Where was that joke? But you're laughing at a woman who has lost 
her hair. And I don't blame Will. I don't know what when I don't know Mr. Smith. I don't know Miss Pinkett. I do not know Chris Rock. But I was glad to see Will. And it, it occurred to me, I thought, well, if he had grown up in my neighborhood, we'd still be looking for his teeth because he, <laughs> he would have been stumped. And that would have been the end of that. I mean, because that, that was not funny. And people try to act like it was Will. Will started it. I know, as I said, I don't know these people. So I, it's not personal. But I thought Chris Rock started that because there's some things that are not funny. And you ought to have enough sense to know that a medical condition, that'd be like laughing at, at Hattie McDaniel being fat. Where was that joke? I mean, you get tired of people acting like, well, they can say anything. And, and that's supposed to be a, a joke and you're supposed to laugh. And the people who were laughing, it's pitiful because the people who were laughing were the same people I was talking about earlier. They were afraid if they didn't laugh, they wouldn't be able to get a job. They wouldn't be able to be in on the next cover. They wouldn't be able to, to, to set, you know, uh, uh, stand up for Estee Lauder or something. They wouldn't be able to model. That's what they thought was funny. If I don't laugh at that Negro, but I do know this, if Chris Rock had been white, we would still be out in the street picketing because we would not let a white man talk about a black woman like that. If Jada Pinkett Smith had been white, we would still be, Hollywood would be upset because they would be saying, oh, why is this black man talking about this white woman? We, they would be upset with, 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 with Rock. But because it was a black man defending a black woman, all of a sudden it's his, it's his problem. He's violent. What was violent about what he did? He smacked him. I can think of a lot of things that he should have done to him. And, and that, that, that smack is, is one of the least of them. Okay. Well, I mean, the, the Chris Rock versus Will, uh, Will Smith thing, when I got on a flight uh, that night because I had, I, had a, I had a concert in Abu Dhabi and I was flying. And by the time I landed, I guess the smack had happened. And so everybody was talking about it, even when I got off the airplane. And I was like, what? You know, what is Will Smith smacking Chris? So I looked it up. And the interesting thing is it's, it divides the room. Some people feel obviously violence is never to be condoned. Um, and, but you're right, on the other hand, she has a condition and that's not to be condoned either to sort of make jokes about that. I, I'm, I have mixed feelings about um, the whole thing. He was banned for 10 years uh, you know, from the Academy Awards, which is crazy. I don't think he should have been banned for 10 years. Uh, they should, you know, they should, in fact, they, should, they could have a public discussion about violence. Personally, I think it's a teachable moment where we can have a, a debate about, I mean, right now we have Putin, a dictator, sitting in army to kill a comedian. You know, I mean, uh, Zelensky, the, the president of Ukraine, is a former comedian. And, you know, the comedy that Chris Rock does versus Will Smith as an actor, these are moments where everybody can learn from that. I, I, I have mixed feelings about striking somebody. I don't think, you know, that's the right route, but also there's a moment of anger, you know, and I felt like he, he really needed to figure that one out. You, you're just going to have to excuse me for saying what was violent. You were talking Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Not one person in that room has not been in a film in which somebody is murdered. Academy Awards have been given for murdering people. Psycho, blood is all over. What are you talking about violence? This is a nation that used to hang people because they didn't have anything else to do. So why is it all of a sudden a black man defends his wife's honor because she was hurt and he smacked him. If, if, if he had pulled out a gun and shot him, I might have considered that violence. But Chris Rock started the violence. And I hate to hear you say that, Paul, that I disagree with violence because you're in Brooklyn. What do you think goes on every damn day in Brooklyn? How many people have gotten shot and killed in schools in Brooklyn? Don't, don't mm -hmm. tell me about violence in America that because one black man hit another, all of a sudden, that's the violence of the world. Give me. Oh a no, uh, give me. Wrong. I'm not saying that I condone or or uh, or condemn. Um, it's more a matter of like, they, there's a whole bunch of people who've written articles from every perspective. Um, from my perspective, I think verbally he could have said something. And you're right. Violence is there's violence that's traumatic to the body, to the mind, to emotions. 
people, it's, America's drenched in violence, as you've said. I mean, movies are, in fact, one could argue they're kind of a, a, a psychic reflection of the violence that's the foundation of America. And in New York, especially because of the pandemic, we've been having a rise in uh, stabbings. There was a guy who shot a subway car up the other day. Yeah. Uh, it's a mental health crisis, homeless crisis. You know, there's some serious stuff. Uh, personally, I got attacked just recently, uh, just going to the Bank of America at uh, Canal Street and Broadway, and uh, a guy tried to rob me for $20, which I've never had in my life. Um, <laughs> we got into a fight, and I said, you're not getting the $20. So, <laughs> But yeah, we really, uh, there's, you're right. And even just here, there's a basketball court. I see people getting crazy arguments. You know, it's... <sighs> As you turn on the TV, you know, you see a war, you turn on the internet, you see Trump, you know, everything is, how do I put this? Um, right now, it just seems like the 21st century is in this, um, this kind of uh, suspended moment of, of uh, no reflexivity. Like people, uh, they, they act, I think if, if he had just taken a quick moment of reflection, it didn't, it, in the long term, I hope that Will Smith and Chris Rock uh, are able to speak one day. It just happens, you know, just talk oh. through. Do you feel oh, that yeah. that's... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My brother, I love you. I didn't know. I'm so sick of that. And I'm so sick of people talking about, oh, yeah, Jesus loves everybody, which just goes to show they haven't read their New Testament because Jesus was sick of a lot of people. And you could see that. And you can see that he did not. When Judas turned him in and he knew Judas was doing that, you didn't see Jesus running over. My brother, I understand. I'm tired of all of that. I'm okay. tired of all of that. And I hope that I hope that Will Smith never speaks to him. I'm glad that Will Smith didn't shoot him simply because it would have caused another problem. And I, if some if, if black men want to shoot somebody, I got a few people. They can call me. I can suggest some names if you're just looking to kill somebody. And it, 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 it's that. But this idea of violence, as you are handing it to me, and I hope they make it up and all, that's that's crap. This is a country that people have murdered people and walked away. Donald Trump, the first thing he did when he was president was to pardon a man who murdered, who sexually abused and murdered a, a, a two or three year old girl. Don't, don't, don't tell me about, it. oh, and, and, and let's talk about the violence. Donald Trump was the man who stood on the, on the, on the, on the, the, uh, at, at, at the, at the mall and said, you know, we are going to fight like hell for our country. And Congress is still acting like, well, we need to get evidence. You can look at the damn television and see the evidence. And if that's not violent, if what they did, five policemen were, were killed who had a family, who had children, who probably had a dog, and Congress didn't even want to until they were threatened with a lawsuit, didn't even want the, the, the one of the policemen, as you know, committed suicide because it all was more than he could handle. And they didn't want to give him his 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 his, his wife rather, in in for for uh, 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 on the for killed in the line of duty. They didn't want to pay her for that. And these are the people. These are millionaires. Just probably not a person in Congress is not a millionaire. Don't tell me about violence, really. Okay. I, I, okay. I, 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 None. Oh, no, I I I think okay. Let's that's um. Uh, how should I put this? I don't want you to feel that I'm condoning or condemning. I'm not. I, mean, I have no, if anything, it's a Hollywood situation. And these guys, I'm getting schooled. So I'm, I'm getting messages from friends of mine. There's a gentleman in the audience, um, Antoine uh, Dry, who's a very renowned jazz musician. He's texting with Jada now. Hey, Antoine, <laughs> Jada uh, Pinkett Smith, is, they're friends. So he's, um, <laughs> but um, he's like, you're getting schooled. So I, people are telling me. I, all I can say is I have I love your work and I'm totally there's no dis no um no I wasn't negative. Judging you. I'm yeah. just saying I don't yeah, want to yeah. hear it. You can whatever you <laughs> want to feel about that's fine. But don't don't tell me violence. This is America. And Rap Brown said, and he was so right, violence is as American as, as cherry pie. And where is Mr. Brown? He's still in prison for a crime he didn't commit. And who do we have for president for, for eight years? Barack Obama, who did not pardon a man that he knew to be innocent. I thought that was, and I think that is unforgivable. I, totally. So just, um, I know in terms of time, it's 2.15. Um, oh. And I just want to say some of the albums that, um, to me at least, just come back, to just linger over the conversation. Uh, your album, Truth is on the way, on its way. Um, every tone, a testimony. 
these are all classics and I'm hoping the audience, if you haven't had a chance to check her out, um, some of these are re re being reissued on vinyl too, which is great. Um, do you, do you, are you open to take some questions from the audience a little bit or, you, you know, because okay, I want to respect time. Thank you. I have a few minutes and, and okay. I want to, yeah, sure. They don't, they don't okay. Uh, so guys from the uh, Brooklyn Rail crew, how do you want to moderate this one? Yeah. Uh, Nick, yeah. So we, yeah, we have um, just a couple of questions, if um, you don't mind. Um, the first one uh, is from uh, Vanessa. Um, you should be able to unmute. Um, let's just make sure. Hi, Nikki. Hey. Hi, everyone. I am so honored to be here today and to listen to you. It is um, something that I would treasure. I'm 60 years old. I work at the New York French American Charter School. I run an after school program and I am so um, worried that our children do not know the power that they hold within them. Um, and trying to, and I know technology is the uh, future, but um, it's sometimes so hard to pull the computers, the uh, cell phones and things away from these kids to get them to open up and have these discussions just like what we're doing right now. And I just want to know in from you, what can we do to let our children know the power that they have within them? Well, I like to, uh, and, and I was growing up and I have a son, by the way, and I like I, I read to him and I think reading to 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 kids is important. I think letting them hear a story, letting them read a story, letting them talk about what they saw. And one of my favorite books uh, is, is a book called Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. And Mrs. Frisbee is a little mouse who husband goes out one, one evening and doesn't come back. And so now Mrs. Frisbee is a single mother. And I wanted my students to, to begin to look at what is this story about? And it's a single mother with three with three kids. She doesn't ask, where did he go? She doesn't accuse anybody of anything. She just knows that she has to take care of the kids. Little Timothy has, has pneumonia and she has to find medicine. And that means that the community has to help. It's wonderful. And you get to ask the kids, well, what have they learned? But one of the things that I had forgotten to say to my students, and I meant to, and I corrected myself yesterday in class, was one of the things that, that she has to tell her children, and she knows that she has it in her mind, is that she's going to have to tell them, you are different. They're different because their father has had these um, shots that uh, he's been experimenting. They, they, he was captured in and the lab experimented on him. And so he's got these shots. So when they finally grow up and meet their mates, meet people that they fall in love with, they're gonna have to tell their mate, this is, I am not like you. I am gonna be different and our children are gonna be different. And I wanted my students to put that into the, the, the idea of this is what happens to black people, isn't it? Is that exactly what happens with, we have to tell our children, you are different. And that doesn't make you anything other than I love you and you're different, but you have to recognize that you're different. But if you are different from them, they are different from you. And so you get this discussion and it's, it's, uh, it's kind of, I mean, that's just one of my favorite books. I, I like to read to, to kids. I, I just think reading is important because it keeps the mind going. And I said, I, I do love space. I, I, I'm, I'm a great fan of the, of the galaxy. And your kids, or at least your kids' grandchildren, will probably be able to go. We, we can go into space, we know that, but we haven't really begun to explore the galaxy as we will begin to go further and further. And so, you know, I'm excited about that. And I like to see the kids get excited about watching the stars and seeing what, what the stars are saying and, and how, how things are going on. But reading, I think reading is just, you just can't, you can't get enough of it. <laughs> you really can't. <laughs> thank you. Uh, you know, Nick, Nikki, and thank you for the question too. I just want to ask Nikki, one thing you just mentioned was uh, you, you, it's come up again and again, like you love the galaxy. I love that phrase. 
Um, you and Sun Ra, your first book, uh, Black Feeling, Black Talk, uh, kind of evoked a lot of that. Did you guys ever meet, out of curiosity, uh, Sun Ra, uh, that 60s kind of scenario? No, we, we didn't hang out. I met, you know, I, you, you couldn't help but meet people because we were all there together. But um, it, it was not a, he, he, I didn't hang out with Sun Ra. You know, I, I, didn't, okay. I didn't get to know him. I, some of the people I got to know when, uh, and I mentioned Diz, I used to, when, when I was going out, as my career was beginning, I was going out to shows like the Today Show, which you had to be there like six o'clock in the morning. Diz would be coming in when we were in Washington. Diz would be coming in from having played all night. He played at the club, then he played something else. And so I used to get to have breakfast with Diz. And those kind of things are just, just wonderful. It's just wonderful to get to know them. So I didn't really know Sun Ra. I know, of course, his music. And the one person that I really, really wanted to know because I love his music so much is, is Thelonious Monk. And of course, what Monk said is, you know, the piano, somebody asked him about, you know, you've been playing these wrong notes. And I will quote Mr. Monk on that. He said, piano ain't got no wrong notes. And that's a quote. And I always like that. And I tell my students the same thing. Poetry doesn't have wrong words. We just have words that are not working right now. So you have to make sure that the word that you're using is the word that works. That That's, okay. yeah. These are, I love hearing this, man. It's just, um... That your 19, your first book came out in 1968, it's 2022. And that sensibility of lingering over the arc of this, of this incredible and powerful career. Um, I do want to make sure I don't, I want to make sure to open the door up for questions too, because I, I, I could, I could sit with you like, man, I'm just, my mind is like, wow, wow, wow. Um, any, any anybody in the audience have any other questions? Because I want to just make sure we respect her time. And yeah, yeah. If, if um, any, yeah, just. Yeah, we have um, one from um, Bob. Bob Holman, uh, you should be able to unmute. Go ahead, Matt. Okay, I think I am unmuted. Hi, Nikki. Hi, Bob. Um, one, I, this is an amazing talk. Just uh, listening to you two, Paul, I'm glad you're getting those, uh, those texts about how you're in school. We're all in school. School's in session. <laughs> Nikki's, Nikki's just taking us back. Nikki, you signed this book to me in 1971. Oh in bed -Stuy. Oh, man. And uh, at that time- Oh, my time, God. Can you, can you hold that up again? We had a, we wow. had a little talk about uh, growing up in Cincinnati, because uh, I grew up in a little town called New Richmond. This is after I left Kentucky. Yeah. Um, uh, same kind of talk I had with Abiodun Oyewole of The Last Poets, who also is a, a, a Buckeye from Cincinnati, mm -hmm. which is that, um, Whenever we talk about it, there's nothing to talk about it <laughs> because that town was so segregated that we didn't even know the streets that each other knew. <laughs> so uh, it's so great to talk to you now, but I was just wondering if there's anything, have you been back to Cincinnati and is there anything from that place that, you know, what do you take from that place into, into your poetry now? Oh. Uh... I, I guess members, I lived in Lincoln Heights, which is in um, the Where's valley. that? <laughs> yeah, it's in the valley. And uh, I was just there uh, reading for Mount St. Joseph. Sister Jean uh, Patrice Harrington uh, has passed, but she was a friend and she had asked me to come out and for a semester, I taught writing at Mount St. Joe. And I was there, I guess about three weeks ago now. And it was quite wonderful to go back. I might well, right now I have on my Rosa Parks t-shirt, but uh, I went and it, it was good. Now, Mount St. Joe has a uh, provost who is black and a uh, vice president who is black. And the vice president is from Lincoln Heights. So, you know, things, things have changed. And of course, uh, for the people who don't know it, should you find yourself in, in Cincinnati, you must go to Skyline and have a chili dog. And I like mine three ways. You have the chili and you have the cheese and you have the onion. You must do that and you won't know Cincinnati. You just have to, you just have to do that. Not that I'm against, you know, any other kind of chili, but Skyline is, is <laughs> the best. <laughs> and there's a movie called The Library. And I don't know if you've seen it, Bob. It, mm -hmm. And um, it, it was shot in Cincinnati and it's about the, the library in downtown Cincinnati. And it's about the homeless and mostly homeless men who want to come in on cold nights because they don't have any place to sleep. And of course the city and the mayor don't want them in the library. And again, now I have a lot of respect for La Rosa, 
because as the men had locked themselves in the library, La Rosa sent pizza over. And I didn't really, I'm, I'm not a pizza person. And I, I'm living in Cincinnati. La Rosa is a big, for those of you who are not, it's a big pizza place. And it was just, it just made me really say, oh, you know, maybe La Rosa is a little, a little nice, nicer than I, than I thought. But all of it is, um, you know, Cincinnati has changed. Jo Joseph Beth is one of the biggest, uh, it's one of the 10 bookstores that are charted. So if you're, any of you are writing and you have a book that's coming out, you, you need to go to Joseph Beth because it, it's one of the books that's charted, one of the bookstores that's charted. If you're going to be a bestseller, this is going to be one of the bookstores that, that they're looking at how many books have been sold because that's how you get to the bestsellers. It's 10, it's 10 bookstores in, in the country that uh, they count the selling. So I, uh, you know, Cincinnati is, is in its own way. When I, when I think of home, in all fairness to myself and everybody, I always think of Knoxville. And it's because I live with my grandparents and it, 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 it's just Knoxville is just, and it, 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 America was segregated. So Cincinnati being segregated was not unusual, but I, I have a fondness for Cincinnati and I have a fondness for uh, Lincoln Heights. And I'm glad to see how we're growing. And, you know, really we still, the land that is called Evendale belonged to Lincoln Heights. And of course uh, it was stolen from us by the federal government uh, doing World War II so that they could use it for General Electric to, to help uh, make war instruments. But, uh, you know, it's Cincinnati, as I say, it's home. I, I cheered for the Bengals. I just, I, I, I was so thrilled when they won the, when they fight, finally made it to the playoffs, to the, to, to the finals, actually. They, they did lose, as you know, but I cheered for the Bengals because um, it's home. It's, it's home too, but not the way that uh, Knoxville is home, you know, and, and, and Knoxville is like a, a, a quilt and it, 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 it's where I'm always warm and comfortable. And I was just in Knoxville about four weeks ago, I think the week just before I went to Cincinnati, but uh, I'm always proud. We go, um, we go to Southern and Western tennis because we're all tennis fans. My mother was a tennis fan. So we go in, in August and, and, and watch the tennis and hopefully we'll get some tennis this uh, this year. Um, I'm not sure, you know, it depends on how the pandemic goes, but um, I really enjoy it now because now Monet uh, has champagne bar right there. So he, he can walk out in his house. And right. now that I'm now old and, and, and I don't have to do anything, I can go out and get a glass of champagne, I don't have to worry about it. That's perfect. Now I know how, <laughs> how tennis really works. Yes, and Bob. Can I, can I ask a favor, Bob? Can you hold that book up again? I just want the audience to see this just one more, one last time. This is like the super rare, early, early. I'm a, I'm a collector. I'm like, wow, I haven't uh -oh. seen that. Can you hold that up to the audience? Yeah. Wow. Is, is that okay? two, that, and Nikki, you remember, uh, you see how it's 295. <laughs> yeah. See, nothing is 295 now, I was going to say. Oh. That's and Nikki, well, that Nikki, my, 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 my Knoxville is Harlem, Kentucky. That's where I, my roots are. That's where I feel it. Yeah, but we yeah. got a lot to talk about, but I'll let somebody else do it. Okay. <laughs> By the way, if, if people, people in the audience, you don't know how rare that one is. That, that edition is like, wow, wow, wow. Bob, thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank yeah. you, Nikki. It's been wonderful. Thank you, Brooklyn Rail. Thanks, Bob. Thank you for your question. Um, we just, there's a lot of great questions, but we don't want to take everyone's time up too much for, on such a nice day. Um, but I'd love to turn it over to um, Ty to unmute and ask your question. Thank you, Carolyn. And thank you so much, Nikki, for this conversation today. I, it's been really lovely to hear you speak. Um, I wanted to I have a question, but I also wanted to thank you because uh, my very first introduction to poetry when I was a kid was the book that you edited in 2008, uh, Hip Hop Speaks to Children. Yeah. And it like completely created me. And um, so I feel so grateful for that. And it introduced me to Sugar Hill Gang and Tribe and uh, Gwendolyn Brooks. And then I grew up and I taught it to the kids that I teach poetry to. And sure. um, so I wanted to thank you for that. And I also wanted to ask, uh, I know you touched on uh, music a little bit with Paul and then again on childcare and education a little bit um, with Vanessa, which was so lovely to hear. But I was thinking um, if you have any thoughts on uh, if you were to do something like that now or to think more about um, poetry education for young children now, um, if there are 
newer poets that you would include or specific messages that you would want to get across in a collection like that today? Oh, I'm, I'm sure there are. I'm sure that there are, but I, 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 off the top of my head, I, I couldn't begin. I'd have to look at, you know, I just couldn't say yeah, but I, I, I left out because I, I, I think for the people that I knew, I had them, but there are younger people coming up. I would uh, first person I do is I would ask a couple of my younger friends, uh, uh, Virginia Fowler or, or Gina Chandler, because they keep up a little, little better than, than I do. Who should we, um, who should we? be sure that we include in this, who should we uh, uh, continue to look at? And so, you know, you're just always trying to be, if I were doing hip hop speaks to children, I liked it because I also could do it with um, uh, a CD. And um, my car, as I say, is old, so I can play a CD in my car. But if you're having a new car, I just have a friend who bought a Mercedes and I was riding in her car with her and I couldn't believe, it. I said, well, where, where's your CD? <laughs> We don't have a CD. <laughs> How do you listen to music? I wouldn't buy a card and then do a CD. She said, no, you can, you know, the kids who know these things, you plug something in to plug something in and it comes out there. And I said, you know, I, I don't want to learn something. I just want to get in the car <laughs> and put my knee and put, I don't want to, I don't want to be smart. I just want to listen to my music. And so we laugh, but uh, the new cars, you know, don't. You, you, you plug something and plug something and put it in your telephone. And then when you get in your car, you turn your telephone on or something. And it's amazing to me, but uh, that's why you have grandchildren. I have a grand a granddaughter, she's 16. And so if I bought a new car, I'd have to get Kaya to come down and show me how to use it. Cause otherwise I don't have to do. <laughs> You'll have to make uh, you a playlist. I don't want to leave everybody, but um, I am running late for something else. And so, uh, and I want to thank you, Paul, uh, but it is, it's 2.30 and I, I need to, and I'm sorry because I'm enjoying myself. And uh, yeah, yeah, look, So, okay, so just, just by way of um, deep thank you to you, and I just want to say you have blessed the day. Everybody is, I think that people's brains are just like, wow. Um, from Black Feeling Black Talk, 1968 to 2022 and beyond, um, along with legends like Maya Angelou, Audre Lorde, Bell Hooks, um, the list goes on of powerful women who have helped change the world. Uh, I just want to deeply thank you for everything you have done. And just like, I, I just wanted to say I'm very, everybody is just, I can, I'm getting a lot of messages. I have one screen with you and one screen with all these people texting. People are super blown away by you, by the way. You have a whole new fan base. Um, I'll, let's just make sure to stay in touch. And I want to, um, I'll, t I'll, I'll reach out through your crew. Um, I just want to say deeply, Wow, and thank you for thank you for honoring us with your presence. Oh. Um, yeah, you are an uh, absolute uh, just supernova. That's oh, <laughs> I see you at BAM. It's sometime in June, but I, yeah. I look forward to seeing you at BAM. You have there's a jazz composer in the audience. I want to give a shout out Antoine Dry. He oh. helps produce um, and works with uh, Wynton Marsalis, oh. and he's good friends with Jada Pinkett. So he was texting me, about, <laughs> and he was like, "Paul, stop!" And I was like, "All right." So um, I just want to say I, deep love. I just, you know, my, my, I, I don't, I'm a, at, at a loss for words right now, but just like, like, wow. And even Bob holding up your book. I, last time I saw that book was, have you seen, do you have that one? That's oh, rare. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, do you have any last words, just any words of wisdom or do, should we just wrap oh. it up or how do you feel? Yeah, no, I look forward to seeing you and meeting you in, uh, in, in, in June. As I said, I think it's the 10th and 11th or something like that. And okay. uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I'm, I'm excited to do that. And my son lives in Brooklyn, so I'm always happy to come to New York. And uh, I get a chance to eat with him and, and uh, my, my granddaughter and his friend. So it's always very nice. So thank okay. you. Thanks a lot. All right. Well, okay. thank you. And, and thank you to the audience for tuning in. Uh, Nikki Giovanni, legend. Thank you, guys. <laughs> thank, thank you so you. much, Nikki. Yeah, huge, huge honor. I did, I did a song if you wanted to close us out briefly. Um, yeah, it's a great, great pleasure, a great honor, Nikki. I I don't have the same classic book that Bob Holman has. What I have is a transcription of your legendary talk with James Bowen uh, that was signed to me by Ada Lewis. Oh, my. <laughs> so I have that at home. And I was thinking because, last, you know, 2020, 
uh, when the show of your friend Ashley Bryan opened at Bates College, period, by a friend of mine, Dan Mills. Oh, okay. And I couldn't come see it, but since I have studied illustration at Philadelphia College of Art, where mm -hmm. he taught. So I knew his work very, very well. And I, you know, in thinking about Bowen, since Bowen himself have admitted or confessed that in meeting Buford Bellini when he was only 16, I believe when he, in 1940 maybe, when he say that I learned about life from Buford. So my question is very simple. What did you learn from Ash, Ashley Bryan? Oh, to love. Ashley, you know, you talk about love to everybody. Ashley, as I say, I only know two people. I only know two people that nobody had anything negative to say about. And Ashley was one, and the other was Diz Gillespie. And uh, I, I, I learned from, from Ashley to just always try. He was a little more, Ashley would not have hollered at Paul as I did. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he's more patient than I am, but I'm I, I still get upset about things like that. So um, we loved Ashley. And um, I guess what I, I, and I don't mind loving Ashley. I, I, you love people. And then that means you get upset with other people. So uh, he, darling, he said, darling, you shouldn't let it upset you. That's what, you know, how Ashley talks. Oh, no. darling, you shouldn't let it upset me. Say, so, well, Ash, some, you know, you, some things have to upset you. No, darling, you can't let it upset you. So I always think about that, but I still get upset. <laughs> <laughs> you just did. I know. <laughs> Elegant. So, uh, uh, Nikki, I am love. That the book that I have from Ashley Bryan. So that says everything. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank can't you. Wait. Can't wait to see you and meet you in person. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. national national treasure. So um, yeah. Well, so I want to thank you for your time. I know you got about you got to jump it, um, and like to be continued. Let's let's uh, let's keep it moving. And um, now that I know you play tennis, I play tennis a lot. It's one of my. It's just a way to just chill. Maybe you know uh, one in some multi, part of the multiverse. We'll, we'll hook it up. Okay. But, um, thank thank you so much. I we you just have you have no idea. You just made everybody's day. So um, day year decade yeah um so yeah. should we wrap up and yeah. everybody's cool yeah. thank you thank you again endlessly everyone go read a nikki giovanni poem today um <laughs> in the beautiful weather if you're in new york thank you so so much really thank you and we'll have a recording of this up um shortly on our uh archive page so please um check that out okay. all right thank all. thanks everybody we'll talk i gotta i have to run too yes happy earth day <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nikki. Right. Yep. Thank you so much, Nikki. Thank right. you. Bye bye. Thanks, Nikki. Thank you, Nikki. That, Nikki. that was Thanks, Nikki. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, you. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Earth Day. Thank you. Happy Happy Earth Day. Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.